for me, early on, merch was part of it. Merch that also made sense and wasn't just kind of being shoved at people. Like one example of merch I've done that I that I loved was that we had a uterus plushie. And that really felt authentic to, I guess you could call it the Sarah Scribbles brand. Welcome to Shopify Masters, your companion for starting and building a business. The podcast brought to you by Shopify. I'm Shwang Estershan, and today's episode features Sarah Anderson, the artist behind her semi-autobiographical comic, Sarah Scribbles, and the book Fangs. Sarah shares with us how she grew her social following to close to 4 million, her process of finding the right agent and publisher, as well as the creation process for her merchandise. Before our show, I wanted to talk to you about our free store setup guide. If you're new to Shopify in the process of setting up your store or wanting to fine tune it even more, our team has created a free step-by-step guide to teach you how to make your ideal store a reality. For the complete free Shopify store setup guide, visit shopify.com slash guide. And now on to our show. You're scrolling through social media and see comics that somehow knows exactly what you're going through. It makes sense of your situation, pokes fun at it in a way where it makes you want to share with your friends. Chances are one of those comics is Sarah's Scribbles. Behind this super relatable comic is artist Sarah Anderson an illustrator by trade who gathered millions of followers online, became a published author, and started her own merch line on Shopify. And it all started when she decided to share her drawings online while she was still in school. I started in around 2011, and I was actually in art school at the time. And that was kind of the era where people were starting to post their illustrations and comics on blogs a lot. So I just kind of posted some doodles from my sketchbook onto Tumblr and they they kind of wound up taking off. And it just co- kind of was like a sign to me that I should continue. And it just grew from there. Mm-hmm. And throughout your art school and also a little bit after, um, I know that you actually worked while you're trying to build up this online presence and build a following. Um, Can you talk about the early days of juggling things and trying to pursue art, but also um, having other responsibilities in the beginning of this journey? I think what I would say was really helpful to me for starting like really starting that balancing act was being on a schedule. So that kind of gave me the space to kind of mentally compartmentalize when I was going to be working and when I was going to be posting. So at the beginning, I was um, I was only posting every Saturday, but that was kind of like enough to really get me into a flow. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of artists or creators, when they first start out, they have an inner critic and they feel like what they executed is not exactly what they want. And a lot of the times it stops them from publishing or posting. How do you work to move past that and actually uh, keep up the commitment to yourself? Yeah, that that is such a great observation because I think perfectionism might be like the number one thing that gets in the way of artists posting and even sometimes making work and letting go of perfectionism is like the most important part of the process. So for example, when I sketch, I sketch on lined paper and I I allow myself to be very sloppy and just to kind of let things flow. And I think it's just about mentally giving myself that space to be free creatively. So I guess for me, it really starts there and I start to bring perfectionism and perfecting into the process later, like when I'm drawing and, you know, finalizing a piece. So I think I would just say like to other artists to maybe find a way to give themselves the space. Maybe that's just the privacy of the beginning of the creative process, but find a way to give yourself that space mentally to just allow yourself to be free and creative. So you started in 2011 and it's almost like a decade of creating uh, Sarah Scribbles. Has your creative process changed at all during this time? For Sarah Scribbles, no. It's always kind of been that sort of pseudo sloppy process that I was just talking about. 
I think maybe for Sarah Scribbles, the only thing I have changed is that I've gotten more comfortable with failure. And I know it might sound a little bit crazy to people, but I used to get very hung up on how a comic would do in terms of numbers. And even though sometimes those numbers, like every number for every comic can feel very big to people, for me, I would compare to like other ones that had gone completely viral and stuff. And I would just, I would kind of let it ruin my day and I would get really down. And it just, it wasn't, you know, for lack of a better term, it wasn't serving me in any way. And I just, I I accept when I post a comic that doesn't do so well in, you know, in my perspective. And I accept that it's part of the process. You know, sometimes you're not going to show up to the canvas and create something perfect every time. And that is totally okay. And those failures are there so that you can come to the canvas and make something better eventually. Because yeah, for myself, like I think all of the stuff that you've done have performed really well, but it's cool to hear the behind the scenes of it and how you react to the comments. I wanted to ask if COVID has affected your creativity, inspiration, and process? So I was someone who, and I'm very, very grateful to say this, was not as affected by COVID as some other people because I've been working from home for a very long time. And my day-to-day didn't change all that much. Obviously, it was very difficult not to be able to see certain people in my life. But if I'm being honest, for the sake of the interview, it didn't have that much of an impact. And I'm, I find myself very lucky to say that. The one thing that I did notice change was I wanted to write other things. So I didn't necessarily always want to write Sarah Scribbles. So I actually I started a new series, which will be out soon. And I, I guess it was hard to kind of find a perfect balance in Sarah Scribbles about how to talk about the pandemic and have it be relatable to a large number of people and, you know, without hurting people or offending them. So I wound up working on some other projects as well. And that kind of gave me some creative freedom. I also wanted to talk about the fact that your work with Sarah Scribbles has been so relatable. I think there's an interesting shift because um, your work is relatable to millions, but it also places you in a position where you are having so many different opportunities and you're living um, maybe a different lifestyle from a lot of your peers. And I think solo entrepreneurs, they go through that as well. How did you deal with, I guess, like the isolating aspects of being your own boss and building out this career? It was very difficult in some ways because the arts are very, like in terms of um, monetizing them, things are very new. I feel like there's been a big turnover. Like I come from the illustration world because I went to art school and studied illustration. And I talked a little bit at the beginning about blogs and stuff. Even back then, that was a huge shift from us sending postcards to editors. And I really think it was an era where there was so much that I was just trying to do off the cuff and there wasn't a lot of guidance. So that was certainly difficult because I feel like none of us, and I'm also talking about some of my peers in cartooning or illustration, none of us had like a guidebook or a specific way to do things. So it, it all became so individual. And that was certainly like a journey <laughs> that, I, that I did feel kind of um, not alone in because everyone else was figuring it out. But I was a bit um, just lost in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it seems like this new generation is like pioneering in this new wave where like the fans actually do want to purchase books and merchandise. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I know that your first book was published in 2016, which is actually kind of like a short timeline from when you graduated. What was that process like of having to deal with a little bit of like the business side of things and understanding legality and going into like publishing your work? I will say with full honesty that I don't think I I did it that well because I didn't have an agent and I was just so young that I, I didn't really fully understand what I was getting into when I got handed contracts and stuff. So it wasn't until I got an agent that I think some of those more business side questions were really answered for me. It really was a big leap going from internet cartoonist to published author. And there was a lot to deal with that 
frankly, I was just a little bit confused in and maybe it will be helpful to some people listening to just admit that I didn't really fully know what I was getting into. And it's okay to be confused, but do do your research. Are there any key lessons or maybe some key aspects that you did uh, really cherish when you were actually looking for an agent or looking for a partner that could help you in those areas that you didn't know about? I wanted someone who really cared about artists' rights. And I did find that in my agent, Seth Fishman. So some agents will kind of, for lack of a better way of saying it, kind of just really want you to make like a lot of money because that makes them a lot of money. But I think for me and my agent, the priority has kind of been to protect Sarah Scribbles and who can use Sarah Scribbles and when. And that's sort of how we go into every project first is the idea of protecting rights. That's super important to know because that is essentially an extension of not just your work, but who you are as well. So yeah, yeah, totally. And I know that in addition, you've illustrated for other books, you've worked on fangs. How do you manage all the different aspects of different projects? And how do you select and find new work that you want to work on? In terms of managing, I would say As I've gotten older, I have learned when to take breaks. (laughs) So um, a lot of times I would try to balance a really big project I would be working on and writing Sarah Scribbles. And the results would wind up showing in my writing a lot of times. So I'm very lucky to be in a position where I can choose when to stop if I have to which is why Sarah Scribbles is not running right now because I'm working on another series. I think for me, it was about allowing myself to really go into what I loved as opposed to what I felt was right. So when I did Fangs, I had just have this part of me that really loves spooky stuff. And I was lucky enough to be in the position where I was, I, I had enough stability with Sarah Scribbles where I could say, I'm going to take a risk and just do something I really, really love. And if it's just a tiny niche project, that's fine. But it wound up being a success. And I think the fact that I I really loved the subject matter and the drawing style so much contributed to that. So not, you know, not everyone has the means to pick and choose. But for me, my guiding force for Fangs and also for the project I'm working on right now, which is about cryptids, <laughs> um, has has really been a genuine passion and love. So thanks, which is the story between a vampire and a werewolf, like definitely a great departure from Sarah Scribbles. What was that like, I guess, internal dialogue of saying like, this is a big departure and it's completely something different. But I think a lot of times these weird social media relationships where people only view you like one dimensionally or two dimensionally like your character. So (laughs) um, was it ever scary to say like, now you want a departure and you do want to try out these new projects? It was totally scary. I think people were just so used to seeing me do Sarah Scribbles, but it was also a very big and core piece of my heart was that story and that illustration style because I had been trained as an illustrator and it was a a story that really came from the heart. And so I think for me, it was just about letting go of some of that fear that people might not love it. You know, I I guess some of it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, which is that idea of fear of failure and always comparing work. I think a big part of that process was kind of just letting that go, which is easier said than done for sure. Yeah. I mean, the last time I checked on Tapas, which is where Fangs is published initially, there's, I think, something close to like 38 million views. So mm-hmm. it definitely still resonates with a lot of people as well. So, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to ask about, in addition to drawing, your writing is also very like punchy and witty. Does it feel more difficult to pack like so much of like, a story into a few words? And how is the writing process like to kind of find the companions to your images? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I definitely feel that the writing aspect is always the hardest. I think when you look at comics, you find that the art is very important, of course, but I think you could tell an amazing story and have it resonate with many people and still kind of have bad art 
you know, I think, I think if you write things well, they will find a way to resonate. So for me, that is probably the most important part of the process. And when I'm being all sloppy in my sketchbook and stuff, that that is exactly what I'm working on is the writing aspect. And it takes me a very long time, um, takes a lot of editing. And I think it's it's really the soul of all of my work. I think sometimes I actually consider myself much more of a writer than an artist. And then on your, I guess, publishing schedule, in addition to publishing on social media, there's been more books that's been published. You have uh, three books now, and I think there's more coming. What is that like managing all these ideas and have it ready to go to the press? That is really exciting. I I think there's just something about putting all the finishing pieces and starting the promotion on a project that is just thrilling. And it's a, it's a part that I love because it's usually I've been working on whichever book for more than a year. And once we get to publishing, it's kind of, for me, becomes a celebration, which is very exciting. Nice. Mm -hmm. So let's now talk a bit about your merchandise and the store, Sarah Scribble Shop, um, which is also on Shopify. At what point did you decide that there could be an extension and you could create merch in relation to Sarah Scribbles? Pretty early on, I think we talked a little bit about how hard it is to kind of find your path and make sure you have financial stability in this sort of new internet world. And I think for me, early on, merch was part of it. And merch that also made sense and wasn't just kind of being shoved at people. Like one example of merch I've done that I that I loved was that we had a uterus plushie. And that really felt authentic to, I guess you could call it the Sarah Scribbles brand. So so that was sort of the process was that I, I did want merch from the beginning and that I also wanted it to feel very authentic and connected to the actual comic. And I see even in your description of items like that kind of punchy, witty writing comes through your knee high socks. These are the (laughs) didn't shave socks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I guess for artists, sometimes they might feel a little bit more reservation of approaching the merch world. Um, For some reason, there's this weird association with like selling out. But what advice do you have for the artists who are going down this path? Because obviously, I don't think merch will be the biggest portion of your income, but it is still a nice um, revenue stream for you to have as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting you touched upon the selling out aspect. And one thing to note is that there's kind of a history in that in comics. And I think a lot of it comes from Bill Watterson, who did Calvin and Hobbes, and very famously never wanted any merch. And I think that is an amazing move of artistic integrity, but we are not all Bill Watterson. And I, while I respect his decisions and the decisions of other people to not have merchandise if they don't want to, artists are navigating this very new world and have a, a right to make income if they want to off of their products, especially if those products feel like they make sense for the brand To sum up my thoughts on that, I think artists, they have a right to have income. And I I think especially when I think about smaller artists and my earlier years when I was a much smaller artist, how difficult it can be. I think it's a move that they should make if they want to. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times your fans resonate with the comics and they do want to have it on a print or on a bag. So it's also a relationship where like it's welcomed as well. Yeah. I want to talk about, I guess, like the business aspects of setting up a store and all of that. How was that process like? Because maybe you were also looking for partners who can help you with building up the store, finding the right production partner and the fulfillment partners as well. Yeah. So the merch store as it is now was all basically done with the guidance and help of Nick Selleck, who is the author of The Awkward Yeti. And he had done his own merch for a while and then approached me asking if I would like to collaborate with him and create my own merch. So that's how it started for me. And I really trusted him because he was a fellow cartoonist. And I felt like our brainstorming really made sense because I was working with someone who not only had done this before, but was very much 
in my world. So that's sort of how that process got started. And we, we did a lot of brainstorming and we have, we kept the products in a place where I feel like they resonate and the shop still feels somewhat small. And we, you know, he knows how I am as a cartoonist. Like he doesn't make me push the shop all the time if I don't want to. So I think finding Nick as a partner in that was really the step that totally made sense for me. And in aspects of the items, what was the creation process like? And I guess receiving samples and fine tuning to ultimately have something that you're proud of. Yeah, there was a, it was, it was really fun doing all the brainstorming and stuff with another artist, which is why I feel like we've got some products that are kind of unique, like the knee high socks that say don't shave. Like we literally sat down at a table together and would draw it and would work on creating it. And then we would have a a process where we would see prototypes and we would kind of edit things down. And we would also decide about what our big products that were kind of showpieces would be. And that process overall was a lot of fun. And because it was with another cartoonist, it was just, you know, it was, it, it just made sense. Very nice. I do wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, freelancing career and illustration career, because I think there might have been a crossroad where you might have thought maybe this is like a path where you would have taken. Has there been moments like that? And how did you like ultimately decide on keeping up Sarah Scribbles in addition to taking on additional like illustration work? I think it's just, it's been a process that has taken a lot of thought about where my artistic drive is really at and sort of takes my background into account, which sort of led me to a place where I love Sarah Scribbles and I love writing it. But in my mid twenties, I sort of had that opportunity with Fangs to kind of go back to some of my illustration roots. And when that worked, I I felt like I had the opportunity and freedom to bring more illustrative work back into my schedule. And that's sort of what I'm doing now where I'm definitely going to return to Sarah Scribbles and upload it because I'm definitely not sick of it or anything, but I'm also giving myself time to do some of these more illustrative works. And I've been really lucky to be able to find a place where I can balance both of these loves of mine. And then I know that recently the Sarah Scribbles like new planners are already out. Um, and I think there's also a fourth book coming out later this year. What was the process like for creating those items? So the planners and the calendars are always just a lot of fun because on my end, it's just a lot of drawing work. I mentioned earlier that the writing is the hardest part for me. So the planner is I'm kind of free to just draw silly drawings of my character in the tub or eating sushi. And it's fun. And I think people can see that when they when they buy them is that every month has different illustrations. And there's really a lot of just excitement that goes into them. Um, as for the fourth book, um, it's exciting to talk about because I don't think I've talked about it on any other platform. But the books are sort of a combination of collecting the best of um the previous couple years of work and then creating new work. And this book was particularly exciting for me because I believe 2018 was the last um, collection I released. So I really felt like I was in a whole different headspace and whole different direction. And I feel like Sarah Scribbles has gotten, has moved a little bit away from relatable humor to like very weird (laughs) humor. Um, An example I would give of that is like, there's, there's a comic where I'm an old lady and I see a dog and I call it a doggo and then no one has any idea of what I'm talking about, but it's sort of gotten a little bit, like I've allowed myself to get a little bit more out there and away from like, I don't want to wake up to like, you know, some of these weirder topics. And I think in the new comics in the book, you can see that. And I, I introduced all kinds of new characters that I maybe hadn't had the bravery to take the risk of introducing before. Like Medusa is in the book at several times. I have biblically accurate angels. Um, I just, I allowed myself to to get a bit spooky and weird with the collection. And I'm just, I'm very excited for people to see it because I think to me, it feels very fresh. Very, very exciting. 
I do wonder, because I think you yourself, this is like the employee of one, the boss of yourself, but then there's so many extensions of different people that you partner with or work with. The question is like, how many people on a regular basis do you actually have a partnership with? And if you can talk a little bit about just like the process of finding those partners and not sure if amping up or like scaling up is the right word, but yeah, it just helps you with your day-to-day and being a business owner. Yeah. So my, my world is pretty small and I intentionally kept it that way. I'm just not really one for creating teams around me and stuff. I, I'm not really sure why, not that there's anything wrong with that. But so basically I have my agent who helps me figure out where my work is going to go, like to what publisher and what online platform. And then I have um, Nick Selleck and The Awkward Yeti, and we work on the store. And then I have my editor at Andrews McNeil. And besides that, there aren't really that many big players. You know, Andrews McNeil as a publisher has a huge team behind it, but for people I'm working with face to face, I think those are like the big ones. And otherwise, I'm I'm pretty much just working on my stuff by myself, which is kind of how I like it. And I think that's essentially like the key for a lot of solo entrepreneurs in that regard, who might also come from the artist background as well. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about the new series that you want to work on or new projects um, that you're able to share, of course. I would love to say just a few lines about that. So the new project is called Cryptid Club. It's in a much more similar style to Sarah Scribbles than Fangs was. So drawing wise and composition wise, I think that sort of simplicity city of Sarah Scribbles is there and that true cartoonishness is there. It's going to be in full color and it's about cryptids and their friendships and their romantic relationships and them just navigating life. So we have, I think, almost like 12 or 13 cryptids in the series. So there's Mothman, Loch Ness Monster, aliens, ghosts. I got permission from the guy who created Siren Head to use Siren Head. Um, And it's dark, but it's also very lighthearted and wholesome. And I just could not be more thrilled about it coming out. And I'm almost done drawing it, but then I've got a colorist working on it. So I believe I believe October is around the time it will start uploading. And we have not yet decided if it's going to be on a platform like Tapas or if I'm just going to make an Instagram page for it. So that's sort of what we're working on, but it will be available and it will be available for free sometime in October or maybe even before that, we're hoping. That's super exciting. Yeah, I love it. And I love the fact that you're taking some of like these classic characters or tales that we are familiar with and diving deep and giving them like your own twist to it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was definitely like such a treat because I feel like a lot of us see your work and it's cool to hear the behind the scenes and how you make it all of it work essentially. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Shopify Masters. My name is Shuang, and if you enjoyed Sarah's journey of becoming an internet sensation to publish author and business owner, please leave a review for Shopify Masters on your listening platform so the show can be discovered by other listeners. Until next time on Shopify Masters.